This is Hacker Public Radio episode 3299 for Thursday the 25th of March 2021. Today's show is entitled, Linux In-Laws, S01E26. Make your Linux harder and is part of the series, Linux In-Laws, it is hosted by Monochrome, and is about 50 minutes long, and carries an explicit flag. The summary is, ever wanted to know about App Armor and SE Linux? Then this is your show. This episode of HBR is brought to you by anhonesthost.com. Get 15% discount on all shared hosting with the offer code HPR15. That's HPR15. Better web hosting that's honest and fair at anhonesthost.com. is Linux In-Laws, a podcast on topics around free and open source software, any associated contraband, communism, the revolution in general, and whatever else fancies your tickle. Please note that this and other episodes may contain strong language, offensive humor, and other certainly not politically correct language. You have been warned. Our parents insisted on this disclaimer. Happy mum! Thus, the content is not suitable for consumption in the workplace, especially when played back on a speaker in an open plan office or similar environments. Any minors under the age of 35 or any pets, including fluffy little killer bunnies, your trusted guide dog, unless on speed, and cute T-Rexes or other associated dinosaurs. Martin, how are things? Yeah, very well, Chris. How are you? How are you? Drinking um, a hazy Jane from Brewdog. Brewdog, if you're listening, if you was if you want to sponsor this show, please get in touch. The address is um, sponsors at linuxinlaws.eu. It's in the wrong order. Yeah, you want... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm only missing. mention the name. <laughs> yes, we are open to suggestions, Brewdog. And yes, I like lo- this is free promo. No, I really like your beers. Do you know Brewdog? It's okay. <laughs> Ooh, full disclosure, Martin is a drinker of real ale. Camera, uh, camera, exactly. Camera, mm-hmm. if you're listening, uh, Martin listening, is yes. yes. Martin is one of your strongest supporters around Birmingham. Um, need to say, sponsor <laughs> us or Martin anyway. <laughs> the uh, the address is sponsors at Linux in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. For for the for for the few people that do not like real ales, there are alternatives, of course, available too, like New England IPAs. As a matter of fact, and that's something yeah, I'm drinking right that. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we do like that. And and in contrast to real ales, of course, these um, New England IPAs would be so w- w- would be served very close to freezing point, as an eight degree centigrade. Whereas, of course, <laughs> whereas real, real, whereas real ale drinkers prefer their beer on 20 degrees, as in just room temperature or something. Well, interesting. Sorry. interesting sorry. pubs you have there in Germany. Santa <laughs> temperature. Sorry, I can get No, Martin, this is what I learned when I visited a country maybe, what is maybe known that's as why England. They don't like <laughs> ale if they serve it at 20 degrees in Germany. <laughs> no, no, they don't, Martin. They only do this in the UK. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure which century you went to the UK. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, this one. <laughs> okay, but this but this is not a show about real ale drinkers. No, no, that's I've been that's, more that's... pissed that they call beer. But this Entirely reserved for the grumpy old coders episodes. 
<laughs> okay. I uh, know. Sorry. This episode is actually uh, <clears throat> um, about something very important, namely security in Linux. So, Martin, why don't you get us started? Yeah. So I know um, I know someone who started this for a profession. I'm not entirely sure why, but <laughs> he appears to be on the show as well. So I think he's going to be a good candidate for this. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not security is obviously not limited to Linux, right? Any um, system you're going to run is going to need security, including Mac OS, Windows, any operating system of your choice. Um, it's Windows. I keep assuming you. Well, actually, no. This is debatable, right? If you if you're not exposing your computer to the internet, then you're probably going to be. I'm fine running this this strange operating system. Yes, <laughs> indeed. So yeah, but this is not a show about bashing the Windows. This is rather something called Linux in-laws, which is, of course, as the name suggests, about something about Linux. Okay, mm. Mark, what do what, what do you know about? Security in Linux. Security in Linux. Well, it depends. Uh, okay. So obviously you have your users, your users have privileges and so on. And then you have root who has all the privileges in the world. So do not run anything as root ever. Un, un, <laughs> unle unless you're using okay. two frameworks called App uh -huh. Armor or SE Linux. Oh, yes. SE Linux. Yes. Because in hmm. that case, Ruder, in that case, especially if you're, if you're running these two frameworks in enforcing mode, and we're going to cover that in a minute, hmm. root cannot do everything like in, in ordinary um, Linux systems where you, where, um, where, 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 yeah. where Martin, where Martin, where, where root as Martin rightly observed can do everything. So while we are on the subject of SE and Linux, um, most software packages I've come across um, that need to be installed require SE Linux to be turned off. Interesting. Would you in like that case, comment? In that case, <laughs> yes. In that case, don't use them in production. That will be my <laughs> recommendation on this. this, this uh, no, this, I mean, this includes if... this enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Martin, I thought we didn't want to go down. I, I, Martin, I thought we didn't want to go down this commercial route. Let's let's leave that brew dog, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, no, Martin. Um, why why would that be poor design if you have to turn off SA Linux if you want to run that software? Well, it's, it's okay. So there is um, obviously off, and there is off during install, right? Which those are the two kind of distinctions to make, I think. Well, off during install is probably okay. But before we go into these details, let's cover some of the basics. Good idea. Um, do you know what discretionary access control is? So that's that's really leaving it up to um, the user to define his um, uh, the, the privileges to his uh, objects, whether they're files or ports or whatever they are, right? So, um, Hence, yes, go ahead, sorry, Martin. Yeah, so, so with any... System <clears throat> security comes down to all the points of access, which is files, uh, ports. What else do we have? Um, networking. Mm -hmm. So at all these levels, yeah, you, you and in discretionary access control, you define it yourself, right? Anyway, but um, why don't you go into a bit more of a deep dive on this? Well more than happy to. As the name indicates, it's actually at the discretion of the user to define any protection on objects and the typical ACLs, the access controllers that you find in ordinary Linux and Unix systems like RWX for owner group and others as in world mm. are probably the best known example for this. Any user that creates a file can subsequently, because he's the owner of this, set these ACLs as he or she, uh, or she sees fit. Whereas in contrast to this, something called Mac as a mandatory access control is normally only reserved for certain administrative users to set. Mm. In contrast to DAC, a Mac is enforced, and we'll see this when we discuss the, the, the prevailing two um, frameworks as an AppArmor as well as as a Linux, and cannot be changed typically by the owner of set object. So if you create a file, if you're just using DAC as a discretionary access control, of course, you can modify as the ACLs. In that case, you, you the, being the creator of this file, you can allow or disallow access, writing, reading, executing, that sort of thing, 
for this particular object. In contrast to this, if you're using a mandatory access control, a system administrator uh, does this for you, i.e. you yourself do not necessarily have hmm. the permission to change these access types. That's the most important thing here. Yeah, so I, I guess um, as an example, would you consider ports underneath a 1,000 as a, a mandatory access control example? This is enforced by the kernel, a very rudimentary Mac, yes. Mm. But this is kind of security by definition, right? Because uh, is, this is basically where Unix comes from. Only services that are below 1,000, 1,025, I think, even, which are normally run by mm -hmm. root because otherwise they won't be able to access these ports, can do so. And the user process is confined to the remaining port range. So essentially, it's a very kind of brute, I wouldn't say brute force, but rather rudimentary uh, Mac by Im implied by the kernel design, let's put it this way, or by the history of the kernel design. Yes, indeed. Well, I mean, you can obviously still set the um, the permissions on a well. Actually, yeah. Okay, so this comes back to the the non user ability to set access on a uh, on a program for a port less than. By, by, the, by the way, did you know actually that on user programs can circumvent this? Yes, but not by by themselves. Right, you have to have root to be able to enable that. Yeah, or you have to actually set a capability in order to do so. Yeah, but you, that's, can, you can't do this yourself, but, right? But that's exactly, but that's beyond the, the scope of this episode. So um, let's go back to, to mandatory access control and discretion access control. Okay, what is also important is probably a little bit of history of historical background in this context. Martin, do you know what the Linux security model your architecture is? Uh, probably not as well as you do. <laughs> 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 um, this is what we Since call you've this for how many years? <laughs> this is what we call good preparation for a Linux in loss episode. <laughs> and Martin, of course, gets full score for no, no, no. I, joke, jokes aside, jokes aside. I mean, it's it's a little bit special. How your um, your um, uh, security studies, by the way? Does Martin does size matter for you? I wonder. No, no, just curious. Just, just <laughs> for any any um, any any. Um, Anyone out there wanting to take up uh, Linux? Two, yeah, two, two weekends should do the trick nicely. No worries. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's. What's it, what's uh, it yeah, say again. What's it called again? Your certification? Uh, quite a few of them, actually. Well, the security one, obviously. Security, quite a few too. So, um, this is what LinkedIn for is for rather. Um, if oh. you go to my LinkedIn page, you'll find. Are you, are you the, saying those are made up? No, they're not. That's what most people do on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> a certain Martin Visser comes to mind. <laughs> a certain Chris Zimmerman comes to mind. Okay, so next time you come, <laughs> we meet each other. You better show me your certificates, Mr. <laughs> Martin, I have the unaltered PDFs to prove it, so no worries. <laughs> good, good. Uh, okay, back to the LSM. A little bit of history, a little bit of history here. The LSM was first introduced about nearly 20 years ago when some people thought that Linux in, in, in addition to the then prevailing discretionary access control, i.e. stuff that was coming directly from Unix and friends would need a more enhanced approach to security. So LSM was born due to the idea that no specific framework would be incorporated in the kernel, but rather the kernel would contain hooks. And this is basically where it's, it's get, it gets interesting. The kernel would contain hooks that would then allow a policy framework or simply a framework, which is orthogonal to the kernel, to be invoked when certain access, certain accesses to certain objects would be done by a user land entity like process. So let's use a simple example. If you open a file, ordinary Linux, you have a process opening that file. With that process, there is typically a user ID associated. Based on the ACLs of this file, the kernel can check if you are allowed to access the file and if so, in what capacity. 
can you access that, the data of that file? Can you read it? Can you write it? Or can you even execute the contents of a file depending on what's stored in it? In contrast to this, the LSM facilitates the following. If a user wants to access a file, uh, the LSM typically takes a look at the file and then goes back to the policy framework or to the framework, uh, which then can check based on profiles in that armor and what this is we're going to cover in a minute or something called policies in SE Linux, uh, whether that process in addition to the DAC defined for this object is, is allowed to, to access this object. So this is the main difference between ordinary Linux and the LSM enabled. The idea was, of course, that each uh, a separation of concerns, essentially. The kernel would implement these hooks and then the, the framework running on top of the kernel would implement the MAC mechanisms as in the mandatory X control mechanisms independent of any kernel implementation. That would give an additional level of flexibility for any framework being implemented to, to realize mandatory access control. Okay. That seems quite sensible. Um, so let's go into the, in, into, into two examples for, <coughs> for typical uh, mandatory access controls. Something called App Armor and SE Linux. Okay. What do you know about SE Linux, Martin? It's very annoying. Spot on. And it was actually developed by something called the NSA. Okay, cool. About 20 years ago. Uh, well, it's a little bit more complicated because the NSA funded a government um, project and this government project basically then had the for initial implementation of SE Linux. Right. Okay. And his kind of um, intention or... Well, what was, was it for aim? Let's put it this way. Okay. So what, and the entry interesting bit, of course, about SE Linux is that something called Android has been using this for at least the last four major versions as the main security framework, particular manufacturers like, like Samsung do a an, an enhanced version of it. Samsung, for example, calls it Nox. But at the end of the day, when it what it boils down to is is, is essentially a slightly modified as a Linux implementation protecting your smartphone. Cool. That sounds good. Okay. Um, Martin, you, you wanna Android, you wanna <laughs> sorry. <laughs> for for those of us running Android of course. Hmm. Well what else is there? You can, of course, run iOS. There's quite a few uh, Apple users out there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hmm. So why don't you walk us through a high-level overview of SL Linux? Can do, if you like. Um, yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's a bunch of patches, right, to the kernel, implementing the mandatory access control things. <laughs> well, um, that would be the LSM. Then, uh, and then, yes. Yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead. You enforcing or, or mandatory and... Um, what else can you, what else is the other one? Is there another option? Uh, permissive, permissive. Permissive, thank you. Yes, I was thinking. You're welcome. Hmm. Yeah, so <clears throat> those are the three main um, settings for SE as as Linux, I think, from memory. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, so what else would you like to know? What typical entities SE Linux con um, defines? Well, it's about policies, isn't it? Yes. There's the, the main difference, or one of the main differences, let's put it this way, between something called App Armor and SA Linux is, of course, not of course, but rather, is that SA Linux defines something like a role based access control model, also known as an RBAC. Hmm. App Armor does it slightly different, but maybe it's, it's a good idea to define what an RBAC is first. Yeah. A role, that looks fine. Yeah. A role-based access, yeah, a role-based access control model basically has users, roles, and the relationships between these entities defined, 
and also basically then based on the combination of users and roles defines the access rights or the usage rights to certain entities. Imagine, Martin, you're running a brothel, right? A brothel that has multiple I'm branches. This, but uh, yeah, I'm sure you can shed some light on this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm more than happy to work. I'm just using that as an example. Martin probably would use a cartel, but the difference are, neg neg are negligible, so don't worry about it. So imagine, Martin, you're running a brothel. You have about 10 branches. The brothels, of course, let's, let's start with the users. Oh, sorry, let's start with the roles, rather, which is much more interesting. So each and every entity in this brothel context would have a certain role. Like you would have... Dames of negotiable factions. You would probably have admin staff running that brothel. You maybe have optional pimps taking care of the promotion of said brothel. And of course, you would yeah, have something called. <laughs> yeah, you would have marketing. Exactly, my one. You would have marketing too. And of course, Martin, you would have most importantly, because otherwise you wouldn't be running a brothel. You would have punters, right? I assume so. Yeah. Without, I mean, without punters as customers, running a brothel probably would, doesn't make much sense. So these are the roles that you have. And of course, you may have also subsequent roles in terms of you would have super dames of negotiable factions, i.e. VIP. What's the word I'm looking for? Hookers. Exactly. Like VIP, like VIP hookers that are only um, accessible by VIP punters, as in they have to have a certain status. They should have spent enough DAO with the brothel to reach that status. Ordinary punters wouldn't have access to these VIP hookers. And ordinary punters, needless to say, are not VIP punters themselves unless they pre-qualify or they qualify for this role. Users then would be people associated with these roles. So you would have Joe Doe, you would have Martin Visser, you would have Donald Trump, just using three random examples, being punters. You would have, and by the way, Martin, um, Femke rings a bell, right? Because she came up with that, with that, with that, uh, with that example. Apparently that's basically how she implemented the whole thing back in the day. Uh, she's a kernel developer at all. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> no, she's not. <laughs> No, she just runs a brothel or two. Ah, okay. <laughs> that, 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 I mean, full disclosure, people, uh, listeners, if you go back a couple of episodes, you know what Femke is all about. Linux security <laughs> modules, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, going back to the to the to the to the users, and then you would have dames of negotiable affection like Femke. Uh, what else comes to mind? I, I Gronje, probably. <laughs> exactly. And Siobhan. Okay, to, to use two Irish names. Purely made up, of course. Uh, then you would have a couple of pimps, and then you would have uh, admin staff running this. So the idea is that, for example, in this completely made up uh, context, a punter can only access ordinary they or can or can or can only make use of ordinary dames of affection because a, no, a normal punter hasn't reached this VIP status yet. Only a if Joe Dow or Donald Trump spends enough money, he's being promoted to VIP punter and can access the VIP dames. So this is essentially the role-based access control model in terms of you define roles, you define instantiations of these rules called users and you define access mechanisms, i.e. Uh, getting together uh, with, de with the name of negotiable affection or paying or something like this. Any questions yeah. on this? Uh, yes, I do have a question on this. So what you're saying is if you're a Linux user and you pay enough money, then you can elevate yourself to root. Mm, Linux, is not, Linux, Linux is not a brothel, right? Well, uh, you, it was your example. So. Last last time I checked anyway. Uh, this is just an example. It doesn't necessarily re <laughs> relate to the Linux uh, to the Linux kernel as such. Ah, I, see. I was just using this as a as an as, as a as a as a as a, as a, as a scene setting, scenery setting, scenery setting for something called the role based access control model. I.e., these are the typical entities you would find in a Norbag. 
you have the roles, you have the users, and you have the well, access control that the these producer. users that, that these roles define exactly. Yeah, the only the, the main difference, I guess, that is um, being able to elevate yourself to a different um, status, right, as a user, in terms of privileges. Normally, this is done for you as part of a Mac. Yes, indeed. So, so your your role and your role and your associated privileges are fixed unless changed by another party, right? This is exactly the nature of a Mac. Yes. Mm. Okay. Okay. Going going back going back to the to the SA Linux. So essentially, what what SA Linux does, it defines a rollback access access control model. Users are normally ordinary Linux users, and then the role would be a definition of something like admin staff, ordinary users, and all the rest of them. And there's also something called a type in SA Linux which is an entity that can be either associated with a process. In that case, a type or a domain, um, as, it, as it is also known, defines how a subject, which is in turn the uh, user uh, or representing the user, can access an object. And an object in SA Linux, in contrast to AppArmor, can be anything. It can be a database, it can be a socket, it can be a port. It can be also an entity representing an X window system, okay. which is quite comprehensive in contrast to something called AppArmor. Right. So um, there's quite a few differences with AppArmor. Yes. And then you have something called policies, and the policies essentially define how roles, users... And types relate, i.e. policies define the way users or processes started by users can access a certain object in a running Linux system. And uh, we won't go full disclosure. Um, so, uh, full, full, what's what I'm looking for? Full disclosure. Yes, uh, we won't go through the technical details of each and every framework because this is way too comprehensive. As a Linux alone is quite powerful and also, as Martin already pointed out, quite complex. Full coverage probably would stretch this episode way into a couple of hours. So <laughs> we will we will leave it at that, of course. Only two. <laughs> Maybe three or four. Of course, <laughs> the show notes will come will contain pointers to the relevant documentation. This yeah. Is, so, go yeah. ahead. So, so in terms of app armor, is the biggest difference with SE Linux that you are um, the, the the programs are the objects of security privileges, or have I understood that incorrectly? Um, to to an extent, let's put it this way: the the type that is defined in SE Linux can also actually reflect to an object. In that case, it's not bound to a user, but rather specifies how any entity can access this object in, 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 in what way. So it's actually a two-pronged approach. You have a process that wants to access a certain object, and then you have policies comp uh, just covering a full object in terms of a, being valid across roles, like a default, let's put it this way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. As I, as I said, the the the, intrins the the details are quite intrinsic and complex. So, as I said, uh, in, in this context, very important. As Linux has a great wiki uh, that that gives you a very comprehensive introduction to the subject, uh, without um, getting lost in the details. Let's put it this way. Of course, the the links would be in the show notes. In contrast, and, and most importantly. As a Linux, in contrast to AppArmor, defines actually modified utilities. Two examples, LS and PS. If you specify a minus Z with both commands, you actually get what is known as a can label. I just, can I just check, is this a Z? Or? Yes, Z, exactly, okay. sorry. Z in American English, Z in British English. Just oh, checking. <laughs> And, and this, and this command line option or flag 
gives you basically prints out the label, which is a combination of the entities that I just explained. Okay, that's useful. Right, why don't you tell us a bit more about AppArmor? Um, it's used in SUSE and Ubuntu, and there's a wiki. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That should be sufficient. <laughs> uh, uh, is this this is not running on on um, Android then? Is it? No, it's not. Okay. No, to jokes aside. In contrast to SL Linux, App, App Armor is less complex. Let's put it let's put it this way, but also less powerful. Um, the equivalent of a poli of a pro uh, of a policy in in SL Linux is, called, is something called a profile. And there's also the main difference that typically a profile is associated with files. Martin, does Plan 9 ring a bell? Plan 9. Cloud 9 does. No, Plan 9. Plan 9. There was a movie called Plan 9 yeah. from Outer Space. Yeah. Should that does, not... Doesn't ring a bell, no? No. no. Should that not need Planet then? Mm. No. Does Plan 9 in terms of operating systems ring a bell? Nope. nope. No, it doesn't. Okay. You heard about the an operating system. system. You you have you heard about an operating system called Unix. Vaguely, vaguely. Keep going. Vaguely. Quite a few people who implemented the original Unix ver uh, the original Unix operating system, i.e. System Five, continued to to um, onto something called Plan Nine. And Plan okay. Nine, in contrast to the original Unix, had an important property. And a guy called Linus Torvalds essentially just stole it or borrowed it and never gave it back. Yeah. Each and every entity in Plan 9 can be expressed as a path or file. You'd see this, actually, if you take a look at modern Linuxes, yeah. Yeah. where you have a, something called a ProcFS, a process file mm -hmm. system. Yep. That directly comes from Plan 9. Okay. And the idea behind App Armor is actually to, apart from a few, uh, apart from a few exceptions, like for example, TCP network traffic, to treat everything pretty much as file. Hmm. Okay. So profiles, which again are the definition of how a user slash process can access an object slash slash file, are just basically relating, as I said, to mostly to files. Yep. And this is one of the main differences where SE Links has quite a comprehensive role based access control model. App Armor keeps things simple. For example, it doesn't define a full role based, uh, role based access control model, but rather it just defines how um, 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 users or processes can access in the, major in the majority of cases files. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do a full back, uh, a full our back for App Armor. Actually, you have to combine PAM as in the pluggable authentication module system, typically found in Unix, in, found in Linux, with App Armor because that only the, only that combination gives you a full R back. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. But you say it's limited to Ubuntu and SUSE. Uh, this would be the two prominent distributions that use it. Full um, details are on the AppArmor project side, also referenced in the show notes. Okay. So, um, okay, why did they go the AppArmor route? Better ask Mark Shuttleworth. <laughs> Jokes aside. <laughs> no. Um, oh, we did get him on the show. If you're listening, yeah. Mark, there was a mail that I sent to you last August. You never replied. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Both frameworks have their pros and cons. Um, App Armor profiles are inherently easier to maintain, but also less complex. In contrast to this, distributions like Red Hat, like CentOS, like what's called Scientific Linux, mm. um, prefer the complexity and the powerfulness of SL Linux over App Armor. Needless to say, both frameworks are available on the majority of Linux distributions, more often than not as part of the standard repositories. So as usual with open source software, you are free to choose 
as you see fit. Both frameworks have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, it's just the case that some distributions prefer SO Linux, some distributions prefer AppArmor. Well, it sounds like um, AppArmor is limited to only a few. Well, the main difference basically being that App, App Armor doesn't define a full role-based access control model, whereas yeah, Linux you, does. You don't have the choice if it's not available on, on say, a, a CentOS or a Red Hat, right? It is. Okay. Oh, you just you have to it. install it. No, no, sorry. No, 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 it's just that certain distributions have a preference for, for one or the other. Okay. Hmm. And funny enough, actually, I think OpenSUSE is the only RPM-based distribution that prefers AppArmor. Of course, I might be wrong, listeners, if you have different views. The email address is feedback at linuxinlaws.eu. Okay. So I think, does that cover the differences between the two? Oh, a full comprehensive discussion probably would take up at least a couple of hours, so we leave it at that, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But so are there any other um, LSM implementations you're aware of? There might be, but I think AppArmor and SLM would be the two mo okay. yeah, most prominent ones you, that you'll see in the wild being used mm. on a daily basis. Okay, um, cool. I mean, I don't know many deployments, many Red Hat or CentOS deployments in production, that is, that do not use at least some simplified SE implementation in terms of policies. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for example, full disclosure, the the website, or sorry, the server behind something called the Linux user group in Frankfurt is running CentOS 7 and of course has an SE Linux implementation in terms of a comprehensive set of policies modified for this web server. Okay. So how long did that take you to set up? <laughs> uh, we have two admins running this. Uh, Jens did most of the work. <laughs> Jens Kühnel, if you're listening, full marks. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I suppose a couple of, of, of weekends, let's put it this way. Right. I mean, essentially, it's it's a standard implementation plus uh, modified for for the for the particular for the particular piece of software that we run in the background. For example, as our CMS, we use Moin Moin. Okay. So, any advice for any listeners out there on? Indeed, take a look at both frameworks. Take a take a good look at the at the at the at the documentation, because both of them can be quite powerful. Uh, as usual, basically. It's the use case that drives that decision. If you need, I mean, both frameworks have a certain level of flexibility, of course, without saying. If you want to have something easy to set up, flexible, easy to maintain, and with lower implementation effort, but confined in functionality, take a look at, take a look at AppArmor. If you're not afraid of steep learning curves, complexity, but much more power, in terms of the exact definition um, of security that your use case is looking for, take a look at SA Linux. Yeah, that makes sense. But so, so in your um, web server example, would you need that complexity, right? Um, that server drives a little bit more than just a web server. So <laughs> there are quite a few other components installed on this, including, mm. for example, main maintenance and all the rest of it. And it's running CentOS, so the decision was taken basically to remain with SL Linux because it's a standard RBAC uh, framework running on top of CentOS. Okay. Any yeah. closing thoughts on this, Martin? Well, to me, um, for my limited um, Linux sysadmin activities, <laughs> I think... Uh, um, Unless you have a really can, good use case, I would go with App Armor personally. Yeah. Yeah. A deficiency that can be corrected, of course, given enough time. Yeah, this is quite an interesting concept, isn't it? Time. It's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> the good news is, Martin, it has been around for a while. <laughs> it has been around for a while, but it's also limit, limited in, in amount. Yeah, not limited in amount, but limited amount for um, uh, those mortals among us. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> uh, the trouble is, of course, time will outlive the two of us easily. 
Yes, it's quite good at that. Yeah. <laughs> Had, has been since its invention, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, uh, they, they, they designed that one quite well. Didn't they? <laughs> who is who is they, Martin? Explain. Well, the great time inventor. Yeah. <laughs> Who's this? I don't know. You tell me. I, I don't I, have I to. Wasn't I wasn't there, so I can't help you. Same here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. This is it. Yeah, no, it's good. Are we done? Um, okay. In that case, we should probably move on to the feedback, the which feedback. we haven't done for a while, but now it's the time to catch on. Up, to, yep. with, by, yep. I don't know. Okay. Yep. Kevin yep. O'Brien writes in, uh -huh. and that's been a while because I think that feedback dates back, dates back to January. In case you've heard... I love the show. Chris is Sorry? In, in case you've heard this feedback before, Chris assures me we haven't done it yet. <laughs> Kevin O'Brien <laughs> writes back on the 29th of January. I love the show, great show, and I'm promoting it on my social media. Kevin, uh, Kevin, well done. Please do continue to listen. We are available on the major pod uh, casting networks. We, of course, are available on Hacker Public Radio. We are not confined in contrast to other software podcasts, to something called SoundCloud. I might add, David, uh, <laughs> they, this proprietary uh, podcast platform, I think. Okay. David and Thomas, if you're listening, it's a free word. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Then the next feedback. Our you friend, want to, yes. Yes. Read this one out, Martin, please. Our friend Claudio, thanks for the invite. I'll have my agent contact you. Claudio, come sta ragazzo? <laughs> Claudio, if you're listening, we would really like to have you on the show. Indeed. Uh, if you're so inclined, please get in touch. The, the email address is feedback at linuxinlaws.eu. And with this, I think it's now time for the proxies. Okay. Which is, which is of course, the... Pick of the week. What's the word? Yeah, pick of, thank you, Martin, pick of the week. <laughs> yes. Hmm. I should know this because I came up with it. <laughs> yeah, well, Quite a while ago. Times, you know, this, this. <laughs> I'm getting old, Martin. What can you, what can you do? Okay, Martin, what's your, what's your pick of the week? As in your box. Week, it is a movie called Man Down. Okay. Which is a, uh, yeah, it's quite a, it's a gripping story and it's, it's really well written, I think, in terms of storyline, um, which I don't know, I'm in two minds whether to talk about it or not, because if, <laughs> if I do, then it gives the whole plot away. So, um, um hmm. the following uh, description does contain, or the following teaser does may, may, may contain spoilers, teaser. people. <laughs> teaser, yes. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Go so, ahead, Martin. Sorry? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, okay. So it's really as you're starting in the future and uh, what it comes down to is uh, someone is living in a reality, in an alternate reality, the way he sees it. So based on events right. that have happened in his past and then slowly the story unfolds and that the <clears throat> reality turns out to be uh, a little bit different. That's not... Um, say too much but it so it comes together at the end really in terms of the two storylines converging which is it's very, it's very well done i think in that way um well, well worth a watch and caught man down mm, it is and um, this is about a drama teacher gets a wake-up call when his girlfriend leaves him no probably <laughs> i'm looking at the wrong <laughs> <laughs> yeah. imdb entry apparently <laughs> <laughs> there are no drama teachers involved in it. <laughs> when was it? When uh, when was it released? Uh, quite recent, I think. Okay, um, let me check that for you. In the meantime, why do you not tell us about your pox? Yes, my pox is actually a TV series called The Midnight Gospel. How can I put this? It's the rage with younger people. 
let's put it this way, without giving a mu- without giving too much away. Essentially, it's about it's about a bloke. I'm specifically using British British English term here. It's about a bloke living living on a planet, and who is able to travel to other planets. And the 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 plot of each and every episode is that he meets through some time traveling machine or whatever whatever that gadget is called. He meets quite a few other beings on this planet, and while the while, while the planets disintegrate over the course of an episode, they discuss mostly philosophical and other topics of great importance. The fun part is, of course, you see all all things strange happening while they discuss very esoteric subjects. Uh, it's rated quite highly on IMDb, if that's anything to go by. Mm. And the, the fun, I mean, it, it, this description sounds rather dry, and I'm not going to go into the details because that will spoil the whole fun. But if you have a chance to 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 watch it, just go for it. Just amazing. So is this a um, movie or a series? Sorry, it's a TV series. Right. Okay, it, debuted, it debuted last year in 2020. Where, where, where can people find this TV? Series? You will find uh, links in the show notes. Okay. And I mean, if you're into quirky animated, by the way, this is animated. This is not kind of for, I'm, I'm real people doing that series. If you're into quirky animated sci-fi funny on the funny side, just don't miss it. Okay. Antipoxis, okay. Martin. Antipoxis. Hmm. Um, yeah. Nothing, nothing for me this week, really. Not even GPU based databases. No, no, they. Okay. Well, I guess they, um, they sort of pale in significance compared to quantum computers, but no, they're not quite there yet, right? <laughs> <laughs> I see. At least they're a step on the way there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What about your antipox then? It's co- it's a beer called Corona. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, that was a joke. Coronavirus, if you're listening. Uh... <laughs> no, seriously, we had it. We just had it. Do yourself a favor and vanish. <laughs> seriously, just go away. No traces, no phone calls, nothing. Just disappear. It's enough. It's over. What we could do actually with the money is currently being spent on vaccines. I, I, will, I won't. I won't even go near imagining it. Mm. I mean, you're talking about five star vacations, including well, hookers, I mean, if, if, blow, and all the rest of if, it. If we're talking about um, money that could be spent better, um, I have there's, yes. a, there's there's a number of people in the world that could be <laughs> uh, held accountable for this one. <laughs> Uh, Jeff and uh, Elon, if you're listening, <laughs> do something useful, man. <laughs> yes, that will be my anti-pox, anti-pox of the week, yes. <laughs> very good, very good. Okay. Okay. Of course, closing remarks, of course, we can be found on Hacker Public Radio, where we will continue to broadcast or to, to upload the, the show to. Ken, if you're listening, thank you. Mm, thank you, um, Ken. Yes, Mr. Fallon, we Great do platform. appreciate uh, your 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 hosting services, capabilities, whatever you want to call it. We will be on Hacker Public Radio until we say so otherwise. Any feedback, please. Also, if you have topics for upcoming shows, so we don't have to think up the crap ourselves <laughs> that we talk about, <laughs> please feel free. Claw your not to get in touch with us at feedback at linuxinlaws.eu. Yeah, well, we do have a, a number of uh, interviews lined up, don't we? So that's that's quite nice. Something to look forward to. Yes. With Alan Tesla, uh, uh, sorry, Alan, um, what's his name again? Jeff and other people. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Any particular Alan? <laughs> no, just saying randomly. I don't know. <laughs> and if we can... And if we can find the, the graveyard, we actually might dig up, what's his name again? Ni- Nikita Tesla? Nico <laughs> Tesla? Yes, yes. Okay. That chap. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure for which purpose. <laughs> <laughs> we crossed that bridge smart when we come to it. <laughs> I think we should probably leave it there. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is if you know where Mr. Tesla is buried, please get, in touch. <laughs> please get in touch and feedback. <laughs> Actually, it's in last one of you. Indeed. And with that, yeah. thanks for listening and looking forward to have you on the next episode in terms of listening to it too. Bye. Bye bye. This is the Linux in laws. You come for the knowledge. But stay for the madness. Thank, Thank you, you for, for listening. listening. This podcast is licensed under the latest version of the Creative Commons license. Type attribution share alike. Credits for the intro music go to Blue Sea Roosters for the song Salad Margaret, to Twin Flames for their piece called The Flow, used for the segment intros, and finally to Celestial Ground for their song Sweet Justice, used by the Dark Side. You find these and other ditties licensed under CC at Chimando, a website dedicated to liberate the music industry from choking copyright legislation and other crap concepts. <laughs> You've been listening to Hacker Public Radio at hackerpublicradio.org. We are a community podcast network that releases shows every weekday, Monday through Friday. Today's show, like all our shows, was contributed by an HBR listener like yourself. If you ever thought of recording a podcast, then click on our contribute link to find out how easy it really is. Hacker Public Radio was founded by the Digital Dog Pound and the Infonomicon Computer Club and is part of the binary revolution at binrev.com. If you have comments on today's show, please email the host directly, leave a comment on the website, or record a follow-up episode yourself. Unless otherwise stated, today's show is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license.